Timuera Morrison is one of New Zealand's foremost actors, with an extensive career in Hollywood as well as in New Zealand. Now, Tim's bio can be seen on page 26 of your books, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll let him uh, take care of introducing himself. Uh, he's of Te Arawa, Ngāti Mania Poto, Ngāti Rāduwa. And of course, because we, uh, we live by the uh, adage, Kāre Te Kumore Kōrero Moto Nareka, I can't uh, say lots of nice things uh, about Tim because he's from Te Arawa, so I'm really just talking about, I'm really just talking about his Ngāti Rāduwa side. <laughs> Which is wonderful, actually, because he's a Ngāti Rādua, I understand, on his mother's side, and he's come home. So, without further ado, Humai Te Paki Paki Te Mwera Morris. Ai kia ora te whanaunga, tēnā koe. Ai tū ana hau ki te mihi atu ki a tātou, i roto i te nei whare. Nō reira ngā mana, ngā mana ranga tira, E ngā pai maunga, e ngā awa. A kua tai a piua mai nei tunu kua te whenua, a te tū mai nei runga i te kaupapa, ka nui te mihi. E mihi mai oha ki a koutou. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Tēnā tato katoa. Kia ora, everybody. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Yes, ka tika te kōrero. Uncle Barney already welcomed me home tonight, so it's nice to be uh, back here. I very seldom come down this way, so... I runga i te o tō karanga li, ka nui te mihi ki au koe hoki. Ku tai mai nei au i runga i tō karanga. Nō reira, kei ku nei au i te nei wā, nō reira, ka nui te mihi. Me mihi anō ki au ku kui, au ki au ku korau ua hoki. Au ku mātua, au ku whaia. Tēnei tō mokopuna nei e tū atu nei e mihi kouana ki a tātou katoa. Kia ora mai tātou katoa. Nice to see my uncle Wera here. Wera Stafford, that's my mum's brother. Some of you may have heard of his uh, hunting prowess around the air, around the mountains here. We also, we also lost our uncle Lambo. Amos, they called him. Another brother of my mum. Has he got a mate up there yet? Oh, okay, yes, yeah, so oh, come by. And uh, nice to see the whānau. Matthew, everybody, I apologise, Uncle Wera, because I never made it to your 80th. I heard it was fantastic. I was actually in Thailand. I got back a week uh, later, so uh, sorry, Uncle. I know you had a wonderful... We had to send some representatives down from our way anyway to uh, help celebrate your 80th, so... Kānui te mihi ki koe e te matua. Actually, I was in Thailand in my last scene in this movie. It was called Hard Target 2, action movie. I was working with all those Hong Buck fellas <laughs> in their Muay Thai. In my last scene, I had to wear the suit. This was it here. <laughs> and they said, that's a wrap on Mr. Morrison. That means I'm finished. That's a wrap. So I just walked into the van, left the suit on. <laughs> See you, fellas, later. And the shoes, too, even. I said, oh, that suit will come in handy. So I've been thrashing this suit all around the place. We had the premiere of Mahana. I wore the suit that night on the red carpet. Then we had to go around the country and hold some screenings. I've worn it everywhere. So you'll see it in all the newspapers and the magazines. So I've got to thank the wardrobe lady in Thailand for giving me a free suit and the shoes. Those are the perks of the business. But look. I'm a bit nervous because uh, I do speak a little bit, but only to the, the rangatahi at uh, high schools. I've been into a number of high schools and give the kids a bit of a bit of a bit of a kōrero, share some of my experiences, give them a bit of a laugh, and uh, it's a lot easier. Put it that way. Many of you, uh, I can't really tell you anything about leadership, life. You fellows are a lot better than that than I am. Some of you are more qualified and you've lived a little bit more life than I have. But I can share a few stories. I'd love the, a couple of you to ask some questions as well and that'll help me uh, figure out what I'm going to speak about. <laughs> Even some of you young fellows over there, if you want to ask a few questions, that's all good too. A lot of my corner would be geared towards you young fellows. Some of us will get a bit old in the tooth to hear what I have to say, but still, 
let me start by uh, ans answering me a question anyway. I wrote down a, I didn't know what to say. I was sitting there yesterday, Lee, wondering, what the hell am I going to talk about? I got to the plane, sat next to Dallas, Dallas Seymour. That was a buzz for me, brother. Ten I used to look up to you fellas on the rugby field because I was one of those useless players <laughs> that just happened to take up space. Mind you, you needed us to make you fellas look good. <laughs> if there wasn't some Koretake players on there, well, you fellas wouldn't even got picked for the all back, so I was one of the Koretake ones. And I had a mullet haircut, a moustache and these skinny legs. But I had the big mouth on the rugby field. Big mouth. Used to love tormenting those forwards. So I wasn't that good at rugby, as you probably know, but I did play for second division in Auckland team called Te Papa and the highlight I guess of my rugby career would be playing Waitemata, a club, club that got relegated down to second division and in that club was Michael Jones, the Iceman. He was a little bit injured, he was hanging out just playing for the All Blacks at the time but then he came down to watch his club team play us guns from Te Papa. And at half time, he came on. The Iceman came on. And of course, I was second 5'8 for Te Papa. And they said, Tim, Tim, the Iceman's coming on. Looks like he's open side flanker. Leave him to me, I said. Leave him to me. <laughs> that was about the last thing I remember. <laughs> After going like this to fend him off. Man, that guy hit me so hard. Oh, my God. <laughs> I think he even lifted me up, my skinny legs up, and I remember looking up at the sky and going, looking down, and oh my God, I'm, this is going to hurt. It's going to hurt, and he just went, boom. Pole driving was allowed back in those days. The pole drive tackle, boom. I think I actually went into the turf, about a foot. Man, oh, I saw, I tell you, that was 17, man, he's a big fella. And I never known a flanker to take up so much room on the field. You see him coming and like we're all just like squeezed up to the man. And then he even had the cheek to bang me on the head. Keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. Keep it up, boy, keep it up. <laughs> I don't know why I'm talking about that anyway. Anyway, I had a question here I was gonna ask myself, just to get the ball rolling. Okay, Tim, Tim, how did you get to Hollywood. Because I was just a Maori boy from Rotorua. Loved doing the haka. On the stage a lot, doing the kapa haka. So that's a good question there, Tim. How did I get to Hollywood? <laughs> you know, I was uh, working in TV, uh, Shortland Street, Dr. Ropata days. And then once we're warriors, three years on Dr. Ropata. Then I got called in to, be a, to audition for a policeman. So I was doing okay, I was getting around and I was starting to break into the acting and I got a phone call from my Scottish agent. He said, bro, they want you to audition for a voiceover. And a voiceover is normally for a commercial. I'm doing a bad Scottish accent. And I'm going, what the hell do I have to audition for? Do, haven't they seen me on Shortland Street, man? I'm Dr. Rupata. <laughs> oh, no, 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 I don't know why, but they want you to audition. And I thought it seemed quite ridiculous. I had to go in and audition just for a voice, just for a voice. And I was being quite negative, uh, probably a bit of big-headed, easy to do when you're an Arawa and an Morrison. <laughs> you get a bit of a big head, I guess. But anyway, I think I must have read this positive book, you know, about being positive and not negative. Uh, I, I think I, I just, you know, I said, well, I'll try this, try this technique out about being positive. So I decided to call my agent back. Instead of yelling him and asking why I have to audition, he, I rang him back. I said, look, I'm very sorry, Robert, about that uh, negative attitude I had. Let me be more positive. When is this audition for this voiceover? He said, oh, they want you to go at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Okay, I'll be there. Uh, any other information? He said, I don't know, but it's, I think it's for a big commercial. So I said, okay, let me go in and do the best job I possibly can. I changed my way of thinking. I thought I'd be positive about this whole thing. So I went in there, kill up, kill there, yes, hello, yes, we'd like you to go to the studio, and here's your lines. And my lines were this, Air New Zealand, the airline of the world's greatest travellers. That's what I had to say. Okay, well, I can say that. Air New Zealand, I thought, hang on, hang on, hang on. 
I was just a bit of a hucker, make my voice all raspy. Then I went, Air New Zealand, the airline of the world's greatest travellers. Ooh, that's very good. Let's do it again. I said, look, look, I'm more in, I want to do it again. I want to do a good job. I'm in a positive mood now. Let me do it again. So I did it again. Let me try it a bit lower so it beats sexy. And I had a little gravel going on like this. Air New Zealand. The airline of the world's greatest travellers. I must have done about 20 times until I was happy. They said, you're so fantastic. No, 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 I'm not happy. Let me try it again. I'll try it with a bit of a smile on my face. Air New Zealand. The airline of the world's greatest travellers. Well, blow me down. They, I got the job. They loved my voiceover. I went, yes. And you know, this commercial was huge. It started with Kiri Takanawa singing, <laughs> then all these shots of the southern, southern Alps and birds and flying. And then right at the end, you heard that voice in New Zealand. That, that was a 10 seconds. And then they gave me some money. It was a couple of thousand dollars. Back then, it was only like you only got paid about $300 for a voiceover and the thing. But because they wanted my voice, I told my agent, charge them heaps. <laughs> they, got, they loved my voice. I knew they liked it from the reaction I got. And then, they were going to pay me. And I said, no, no, no. Hang on. I don't want the money. I want a free airfare to Los Angeles. <laughs> and so because there was a couple of thousand, I was able to go to Los Angeles a couple of times. And that's how I got to Hollywood. <laughs> on Air New Zealand. But just going back, one, I got the ego out of the road. Got the ego out of the road, that Morrison big head, that Ottawa big head. I said, no, no, be positive. Got the negativity out of the way. What I did was just deal to the business. What was the business? The business was doing a good voiceover. So that's all I focused on, doing a very good voiceover. I got the job. I was able to go to LA a number of times. And in those trips, I met my agent in, uh, in Hollywood. And um, obviously, Once Were Warriors helped get me in the door because that film made a bit of a mark internationally, in fact. So, yeah, so that was interesting. So, that was a pretty good question there, Tim. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, well, I'm just giving you time to think of a question. I think I'll ask me another question since I can't see any other questions. Why acting, Mr. Morrison? Why acting? Why acting? That's a bloody good question. Why acting? Well, why not? Hey. In fact, there were so many singers in my family, they, they kept telling me to shut up. We were doing kapahaka a lot. We got to travel a lot. We were blessed as a young, uh, as young mokopuna. My dad was a fellow called Laurie Morrison. He was Howard's older brother. He married a lady called Hannah Stafford from... Uh, Hangatiki, Maniapoto, and their mum's dad was from down here. His name was Harry Stafford. So uh, we were blessed to brought up in Rotorua, always singing, always around Uncle Howard, setting up the speakers. Then that led us into our kapahaka. Then that led us to going into more serious kapahaka, where we joined our tribal groups. The group I joined was Ngati Rangi Wewehi. And uh, we used to go away to the, uh, what is known today as the Matatini. And that was a big part of my life. And then I thought, well, I was getting on a little bit older and I moved to Auckland. And I auditioned to go on a uh, performing arts course. And on the performing arts course, we were used as extras. Extras are the people you see in the background, in the movies. So that's how I started. I started being an extra. Uh, I remember my few first few roles was like a street kid. I was just being the street kid. Okay, you street kids, walk across the road. Over there. Action! So we just had to walk across the road. And then I soon figured out, man, I don't think that camera can see me right across the road here. I think I have to work my way closer to this camera here. So I figured that out pretty quick. Get a bit closer to the camera. Acting, there wasn't many Māoris too when we started off. I had people like Don Selwyn. I don't know if you remember that wonderful actor. He was in Mortimer's Patch and Pukemanu. And he took me under his wing and uh, we were all trained under him. 
And uh, one thing led to another, a couple of TV, little small parts, a couple of smaller parts, and then I got to audition for uh, Shortland Street. I think they needed a couple of brownies because everybody else was white, so uh, we had to make up the numbers, the brown quota. So that was me, Dr. Ropata. I remember too, we had to learn all that fancy medical jargon, and I remember I was trying to save somebody, and I had to say, the patient's going into ventricular fibrillation, <laughs> meaning a heart attack, I think, and I couldn't say it. The words were too tricky for this Māori boy from Rotorua. <laughs> oh, the patient's going into ventricular fi 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 Take 20! Okay! The patient's going into ventricular... Uh, the patient's going into VF! And the other Hector goes, what's VF? A very fact. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, man, we were also better trying to learn that dialogue, I tell you. Then I got a, a chance to audition for... Uh, once were warriors. Ooh. And I was going to be the policeman. I got the role of the policeman that arrested a boogie, boogie. And then I got called in to be Uncle Bully. And I looked like I was going to play Uncle Bully right up to the very last minute. And then my agent called that same fellow, Robert. Hey, bro, guess what, bro? Now they want you to, to read for Jake the Moss, bro. I said, Jake the Moss? Ooh. <laughs> and look, I was skinny Dr. Ropata, right? And Jake the Mus is a big fella. Big in the farana. So, man, I had my work cut out. So I went into the Shortland Street uh, wardrobe, found an old shirt with no sleeves on it, had skinny arms. I found a felt pen, put some dots all over my face, make me look mean and tough. Then I went into that audition. And I was thinking, sitting outside, as a few others were going in. I said, okay, well, I've got Uncle Bully. This is a... I don't want to play the rapist. I think I want to be the... <laughs> I think the wife beat is better than the rapist. So, uh, uh, I know it sounds bad now, but anyway, that's how, that's how I was thinking. Okay, I've got to get stuck into this. I've got to show this director I can do it. And you see, when you're an actor, you know, it's a bit different, because we haven't got any tools. For example, a carpenter would, well, you get good at building because you're working with the hammer and the nails and the, and the saw. And the, but with, when you're an actor, you've got, no, you got these tools that you use, you can't touch them. They're all stuff on the inside. You know, you can't actually grab hold of the tools that we need. So all I remember, I was trying to psych myself up. And you know what I thought of? The one thing I knew how to do was how to do the haka. Ha! The breath, ka, fire, haka. And so this is what, this is me outside getting ready for my audition, Jake Damas. I'll say my tarawa haka. And I was just whispering it softly to me. And so in a way I'm actually stirring up my inner energy by doing my own haka. I do my haka on the inside. <laughs> so I'm doing all this. Then I walked into the audition and I had to do that scene where I just beaten up Beth Hecke. And she goes, I'm sick of your mongrel mates coming around here. And I had to say, who the bloody hell do you think you're talking to and all that stuff. But I was doing the haka. And then I sort of just toned it all down. And I carried on. <laughs> and then the director saw that, hey, and he gave me the part. He gave me the part. He told the producers, yep, I want Tim Morrison to play Jake. The Mus. Well, they all fell over. Look, he doesn't even look like Jake the Mus. He's too skinny. His hair was too long. Well, they, they started just, they were going to even bring up Buck Shelford to ask him to audition for Jake the Mus. Two. Lucky like he, he did it, huh? but that was a, that was a, they gave me the part and they stuck with me, even though the director had a little, was a bit nervous. Then he called my agent, we're going to go with Ted, but he has to go to the gym, so I had to do a crash course on the weights, and they, he, my agent would ring me up if I wasn't at the gym too, Monday through to Friday, 
Monday through to Friday, we're at Clive Green's down in Newmarket there, and the whole gym kind of got behind me, give me a milkshake. Then I got my mum up from Rotorua to come and stay with me in Auckland, so she could feed me up, mince on toast, scrambled eggs, eat a whole chicken, milkshake. I had to put on weight. And then the wardrobe lady at Shortland Street said, Tim, you're filling out your doctor's coat. So I was getting bigger, going to the gym. And then that's that fellow you saw on Once Were Warriors, after all of that hard work. Quite, oh, that woman on the, who played my wife, Rena Owen, that woman was so powerful. We really had to lift our game. We really had to come up and match her energy. She was so powerful. So all of us really had our work cut out. She was such a brilliant uh, actress, and she had a well of emotion that she could draw on. It's quite hard to cry in the movie. Cry. You really got to take your mind and get yourself into those things. And that's what we get paid to do as actors. Okay, I'm talking too much. I don't want to talk too much because you probably don't deserve it. What's another question I can ask? So that's how I got into acting. Any questions yet? Young fellas? Okay, I'll have to. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great. Fresh meat? Let's not talk about that movie. Another question. We'll get back to it and I'll tell you about that later. Django Fett? Django Fett. Some of you might know who Django Fett was. I met a lady in LA. She was looking for a, a bounty hunter. And I had to go see her, have a bit of a chat. And they cut a video like this on, and I'm just talking, being nice. And then a few months later, they called me up. We'd love you to play Django Fett in Star Wars. I went, yes, yes, yay! Uh, uh, who, who's Django Fett? <laughs> well, apparently, he's a bounty hunter. That was great, except I had to wear a helmet over my good-looking face, so no one could see my handsome face. I had the helmet on my head most of the time. And then I like to do my own stunts too, so I was doing all my own stunts, doing all my fight scenes, my helmet on, shooting my pretend guns. And then I was looking at my double. He had the same outfit on, same helmet, but he was eating all the biscuits. <laughs> they have a craft service, you know, a cup of tea place. And I could see him eating all the biscuits, and I thought, wow, I think I should go eat the biscuits and put the stunt double in it, because no one could tell who the hell's underneath this helmet. <laughs> So yeah, so I got the stunt double to do the rest, and then uh, I told, told the producer, call me when the helmet comes off, I'll turn up to work. Thank you very much for those questions, boys. Okay, here's another good question. I think I wrote a real nice question down here for me. Oh no, I didn't. No. I'll have to make this question up. Who was one of the interesting, most interesting person you met, Mr. Morrison, while you were on your film travels? That's a great question. Mr. Morrison, one day I got to audition, I got a phone call to go to Mexico City to audition for an Indian, an Indian, um, like the red Indian, uh, like the American Indian. So I went out, flew over to Mexico City, quite a long flight too there. I met the director, I did a bit of a talk with him, and then they flew me home. And then by the time I got home, I had to fly all the way back again because he wanted me back. So I was home for a couple of days and I flew back. Now this uh, movie was called uh, Blueberry. And I had to, uh, he didn't, he, he looked at all the other Indian actors in America, but he thought they were, act they were all a bit too big and he, he liked my subtle style. So uh, I got taken down to a place called Mexico. Now this person who came up to play my father, he was from the Amazon jungle. And his name was uh, Guillermo. And he was playing my dad. But what made this chap very interesting was where he was from, he's from a, the Shipibo Indian. And they have this little concoction called ayahuasca. Ayahuasca. I don't even know how to spell it. It's quite a tricky one to spell. It's uh, around in the Amazon jungles with the local Indians there. 
So in the movie, the director wanted me to do some of this ayahuasca ceremony. And so we actually had to participate in this little ceremony where the Indian, it's a bark and a leaf foliage. It's organic. It's not like a, uh, 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 like a hallucinogenic or a real drug. It's actually a, a bark and a leaf that they mix together. Actually, it looks like liquid, uh, brown liquid. It doesn't look too good. <laughs> brown look. But the Indian, shaman Indian, he goes like this. He gets it in his bowl and he goes... <laughs> he's blowing into it. He's channeling all this energy. And then you have a bit of a zip, a drink of it. And then I'm sort of waiting around and then, whoop, bam. You're, you go, you go, to, uh, you go uh, to a place... That our tupuna call the Rangi Tu Ha Ha. I don't know if you've heard of that place, the Rangi Tu Ha Ha. It's a place. He takes you to the Modi. The Modi. Not the Maori, the Modi. He takes you to a place where you realize that we are all an energy, a vibrational force. Like this. Now I know why we us Māori shake hands like this when we do our kapahaka. You know why we do this? You fellas do it, do it, do it, do it, do a witty. Do a witty. That's it. You know what that is? That fellow Yoda in Star Wars talks about it. The force. The force be with you. But it's actually quite wrong saying the force be with you. Because... When I had this little experiment with this Indian, you realize the force is inside you. And our tupuna called it the Modi. I think we have replaced the word Wairua a lot more. And we're using Wairua a lot. And not so much this life force, this energy, this life ethos, they call it. Life principle. And that's where he takes you. I had to fly all the way to Mexico, meet a Shipibo Indian from the Amazon to get this feeling of Modi. This man introduced me to something which I just thought we'd talk about. In fact, when you go to any hui, what do you hear first? Tihe Modi Ora. Tihe being the sneeze or the breath. The sneeze of the life force. We are again acknowledging the life force that Tane imbued into us, into our first being, Tiki. This Modi, this life force. So he would be the most interesting fella I met in all my travels. Anyway, what's my last question? Any other questions out there? Yes, sir. Yes, please. Don't be shy. Well, I like the nature of love since it was my kind of signature song. <laughs> would you honor us? Of course, of course I would, of course I would. <laughs> hey, let me answer my last question. <laughs> so what's it all about? That's what I've asked myself. What's it all about? Being successful? No. Being significant. My sister, Tiny, is an example. She used to love the kapahaka. She used to perform with te mata rai orehu. She had blonde hair. She suddenly passed away about five years ago. 10,000 people turned up to her tangi from all around the country because they loved her kapahaka style or they respected what she, how she performed. Groups from the East Coast busloads. We couldn't believe it. Everyone will say, gee, bro, I thought you were the famous one. Looks like your sister's more famous than you. I said, well, judging by the kai, you know, I think we counted over 10,000 meals we put on at her, at her tangi. There was a lot of people coming to pay respect. She was significant in her kapahaka. Very significant. This new movie, Mahana. I don't want to ruin it for you, but it's a beautiful movie. It takes you back to the 60s when wool was our prime export. So if any of you have been on a farm, 
Any of you been in a wool shed? This is the movie for you. No mind all that gang warrior shit that I play. <laughs> this is a beautiful movie. Even though I play a hard old man again. For some reason, I'm a bit of a clown in real life. I tell a few jokes, but they get me to play these serious roles. And this movie, Mahana, is based on the book of Bully Basher, written by Witty Ihi Maira. Ihi, I call him Ihi Smiler. He's a smiler, but they changed the name to Ihi Maira. Beautiful man. He wrote The Whale Rider, wrote a number of novels. He wrote a wonderful book about his upbringing at the sharing gangs. There's a lot of layers in this film about Aroha, some hidden love story going on there, the work ethic. I'm playing the hard old man who's just talking about work, 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 work. But in this movie, what I'm getting to is, uh, you know, I might, have to, I might have ruin it for you. Ah, oh, what the hell. <laughs> well, in the movie, I had to, uh, I die. I die. Oh. That's right, I died in Star Wars too. I gotta watch the end of that movie, see what happens. After I, my head got chopped off, I lost interest. <laughs> then I died in the Green Lantern, I gave the fellow the magic power, and then I died again. I'm always dying. One day I'm gonna live. So, so I've been going around the country giving talks after the movie. So the first thing I say is, I'm alive! I'm alive. But while I was doing the movie, I had to lie in my coffin. For about two days, I think. Two days. Two days tangy, I think it was. I was getting a sore nono lying in my black <laughs> coffin. No, Jim Moriarty, the other actor, my plays the poata. He, he hates me because I, I, I would tell you. He comes up to me, oh, Tim Werner, Tim Werner, your, your performance is looking a bit stiff. <laughs> yeah, we were all having sort of jokes at me. Then I was walking around with my white makeup on because I had to look deathly. And they go, geez, you don't look very well today, Tim Werner. <laughs> That's because I'm dying, I'm dying, man. But while I was lying in my coffin, I'm thinking, shit, what happens at my real tummy? <laughs> I just started thinking about my, all these people that turned up to my funeral, they all got paid to turn up, they're all extras. So I wonder, gee, wonder, wonder who's going to come to my tummy? It just made me think about that. Who's going to come to your tummy? Then I started thinking about, what are the things they are going to be saying at your tangi? What? I know these fellas in the scene when they were saying some nice things about me. And that made me think, oh, you bloody bugger, Tim Werner. Pinch my bloody missus. No, those are the things I don't want to hear at my tangi. I want to hear Tim Werner. Thanks for coming down to Blenheim to talk to the Tane Ora conference. We really appreciate it. That's a lot better, isn't it? And then I started figuring out, wow, you just think about what the things you want them to say at your tangi and then live your life accordingly. I love that movie Gladiator. Russell Crowe at the beginning, right in the beginning, he's trying to rally up his troops to go to battle and he says it's what you do in this life that will echo into eternity and I started to think about that it's what we do in this life that will be echoed on your sacred marae so we only have one Modi only one Use it. Don't abuse it. Tena koto kato.
I've killed everybody. Thank you, Lee. Thank you very much for the Tonga and the wonderful book there, Poon Namu, and the Tonga and my wonderful t shirt. So, thank you again. There are any more questions, or I'll just hand it back over to you. I think we're good for time. No? Okay, thank you again very much. Oh, I better sing that song. Where's your guitar? I'll just have to sing an a cappella. No little guitar around here. Only electric one. <coughs> Well, I try as hard as I can just to make you understand. Cause the world, it won't stop. It keeps going, going round and round. This is Beth's part. That's the nature, the nature of love. And it's always, always been this way. Here is my heart. I remember. Yesterday's understanding your every way, and I know the world never stops, it keeps going, going round and round. So now, my lover, there'll be no other. The stars in the heaven will shine forever. A moment we treasure your undenying love. So, darling, here is my heart. So, darling, here is my. Oh, yeah, thank you again. Thank you very much. Kill everybody.